Hello and welcome to Dragon Bite, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatric trainees or anyone interested in child health. I'm Stacey Harris, one of the paediatric trainees here in Wales. Today we have the second part of our Tetralogy of Fallow series. This time we're focusing on the management of Tetralogy of Fallow. You're in for a treat. Professor Uzun definitely has a way with teaching cardiology. Over to Asim. Once diagnosis is established, then treatment, more relevant treatment for pediatricians, monitoring, making sure this patient will remain asymptomatic, meaning that will not have much feared complication of tetralogy of follow. Mm-hmm. Can you remember what could that be from your training? Yes. Yeah, yeah the, the, um, spells, spell attacks. Spell attacks. Yeah. And what else is called? Hypoxic spells. Yeah. Tetralogy spells. Yeah. Blue spells. Mm. And it's named with various ways. Yeah. Can you tell me why that hypoxic spell might occur in infants, particularly in infants? It happens in all the children as well, but now we hardly see those children beyond the first few months of life because we diagnose them earlier. Yeah. The older children would present with squatting. Yeah. But in neonates and infants, hypoxic spells can occur due to imbalance mm-hmm. between pulmonary vascular resistance and systemic vascular resistance. Mm. It is not due to subpulmonary obstruction. I'd like you to clarify that in your mind. Okay. What happens? PVR suddenly goes up mm-hmm. and or systemic vascular resistance suddenly drops. Mm-hmm. The triggers for that could be very simple. Feeding or warm bath Mm. or first thing in the morning when the child wakes up or when the child is crying. All of these have one classic hemodynamic problem Mm. which is reduction in systemic vascular resistance. After feeding your abdominal vessels enlarge Mm. and all your blood is retained in your gut and your systemic vascular resistance drops. Mm. It allows more blue blood to go through VSD into the right ventricle and aorta, resulting in cerebral hypoxia and increased cyanosis. As a result, child becomes agitated, Mm. cry, and becomes very unwell, blue. During that time, if you listen to child's heart, the murmur disappears or becomes very faint because PVR is so high, the right ventricle cannot push blood into the lungs. Mm. It's not because subpulmonary section closed. Mm. It's not due to that. Similar principle applies to the patient when they wake up in the morning or warm bath. Mm. Peripheral vasodilatation leads to reduction in systemic vascular resistance. Mm. We need to pay attention to those periods Therefore, we should educate and inform parents to prevent such thing happening. Hypoxic spell can cause death sometime if it is not managed appropriately and acted on quickly. Mm. The simplest thing we can do, there are two things perhaps you may remember from your training years, Asim, if you tell me. I, well, I, I remember. What would you do to increase your systemic vascular resistance? what extremity you would utilize to increase someone's systemic vascular resistance um well normally their legs absolutely yeah. your legs mm. your legs is the major tool for you mm. to utilize here yeah what would you do with infant's legs if the child is spelling so it's the classic um, knees to the chest position absolutely i would bend patients child's legs Mm. from the knee and push them into child's abdomen Mm. or push into child's abdomen if you cannot bend the knees Mm. but you can do both if you like 
that would increase systemic vascular resistance. Hence, it would reverse the shunt from right to left to left to right, or it would balance it. Yeah. Unless the oxygenated blood would be going to the left side and to brain, mm. and hypoxia would resolve and the child would get better. Okay. That's first one. Mm. And second one, ABC, mm. opening airways. When we open airways, you need to give oxygen to it. Mm. Oxygen should be used with care and attention because it's not only pulmonary vasodilator, the main mechanism, oxygen is helpful here mm. because it reduces PVR by pulmonary vasodilatation. Fine, so all the resistance they've got in their, in their pulmonary vascular system drops as the oxygen enters the system. Correct. Yeah. But oxygen also reduces systemic vascular resistance. Mm -hmm. You need to be very careful. Mm -hmm. And oxygen might also decrease cerebral perfusion further because mm -hmm. it leads to cerebral vasoconstriction. Right. We need to be careful in that. Right. So we should be monitoring their blood pressure, I suppose, while we're doing it. Absolutely. What happens to blood pressure when child starts spelling? Is it high? This was also an exam question yeah. at one stage. Does blood pressure go up during hypoxic spell? I think it doesn't initially drop during the hypoxic spell. Excellent. Mm. Correct. It drops, PVR goes up, mm. and blood pressure drops. Mm. And what happens to heart rate initially? It's only become tachycardic in order to sort of compensate Wonderful. for the low blood pressure. Wonderful. Tachycardic. Remember those tachycardia mm. and low blood pressure because we will use it in hypoxic spell treatment. Mm. Some of the medications we, we give, it is to counteract these measures. Mm. We gave oxygen, we did knee chest position, we opened airways, and now we will try to improve patient circulation. And we need to break that vicious circle by reversing tachycardia, by reversing imbalance between systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance. Mm. How are we going to do it? First, we will establish IV line if there isn't any. Mm -hmm. After IV line, we will give volume. Mm -hmm. Say so it's taken a long time to establish IV line. Should we just let the child suffer? No. Are there any other ways we can administer medications which are helpful in the management of tetralogy of phallus? Can you remember any medications we use? Well, we, we often use morphine, don't we? Morphine? Yeah. That's correct. Why do we give morphine in tetralogy of phallus patients? If you think about it, child is very agitated, mm -hmm. crying inconsolably. Mm -hmm. So what morphine does? It calms the child. Yeah prevents tachycardia. Mm. What else? Mor what morphine does? Relaxes muscles. Yeah. Yeah. Relieves anxiety. Yeah. But it also does something which we are very, very careful about. Mm. Depresses our respiratory centers. Mm. So when we give morphine, we need to be careful, make sure Ambo will be with you yeah. and oxygen will be available. Mm -hmm. And you will have all the tools to be able to intubate the child. Morphine can be given intramuscularly. Mm. You don't need intravenous route. If you have morphine, then what you can do, um, you can give these patients intramuscularly. I would give 10 microgram per kilogram mm. intramuscular morphine, and you can give up to 50 and 100 microgram per kilogram morphine injection. Mm. That is the first step. In fact, intramuscular one is less toxic compared to interv intravenous form. Mm. It doesn't lead to respiratory depression as much as the intravenous form would do. Mm. Intravenous morphine should be given slowly. Mm. How about beta blockers? Well, that seems like a, a good way to resolve tachycardia. That's brilliant. Well remembered. Yeah. I'm impressed. So propranolol is um, is a beta blocker, which will um, break the vicious circle of tachycardia. Mm -hmm. 
tachycardia results in inefficient cardiac output, mm. inefficient filling translates into inefficient output. Yeah. If there isn't enough forward flow into pulmonary artery or systemic circulation, the cyanosis will continue. Mm -hmm. How much propranolol we need to give and which route we should we should utilize? I genuinely don't know how much propranolol, yeah, what does propranolol is in this case? It would be very helpful if propranolol can be given sublingually mm -hmm. or as a spray. I always thought about it, Yeah. but it can unfortunately be given only intravenously. Mm -hmm. You give it intravenously and it should be given slowly again mm -hmm. because BP is already low. Propranolol can reduce also blood pressure, yeah. remember. Most people would wrongly assume that propranolol relaxes muscles mm -hmm. and therefore relieves the, relieves the obstruction. But what it does, it decreases contractility. That's how it, how it makes it easier. Mm. And heart relaxes and has more time to fill yeah. and more time to pump. Mm. That's what propranolol does. It has effect on the reduction of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction because it moves the walls away from each other. Yeah, but it is not the main mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's by negative inotropic effect. It helps further and better and improved pulmonary flow. Right. But the main effect on the tachycardia. The other effects also important. If child is still having problem, you can repeat morphine. Mm -hmm. uh, morphine can be given higher doses, 100, you can go up to 200 microgram per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Intramuscular doses can be repeated. Mm -hmm. And you can repeat morphine um, every minute if necessary. Mm -hmm. Say you tried morphine sulfate, you tried volume, you tried intravenous propranolol, and child is still not responding. What is next? You need to call anesthetist, you need to call your colleagues and consider child to be on another medication can be given intravenously. Mm -hmm. It's called phenylephrine. Mm -hmm. What is phenylephrine? Um, an alpha agonist. Wonderful. Yeah. So what My old pharmacy knowledge coming back to me. <laughs> well, it's obviously <laughs> very easily retractable. <laughs> so you pulled it <laughs> pulled to it your from use the yeah, yeah. from the recesses. <laughs> it's true. Mm. Alpha mimetic. Mm. And what does it do? So uh, so this, this is where I'm at. Because I just thought that it would actually worsen the tachycardia, given that it's an alpha agonist. It's wonderful. I like your um, questioning mind. Mm. But what was the reason patient was having spell in first place? Reduction in systemic vascular resistance and blood pressure. Yeah. So what does um, phenylephrine do? It increases your blood pressure. Oh, of course it does. Yeah. That is the reason. You How much do we give it? it? Oh, I have no idea. So we <laughs> give it again between, initially you give a bolus, stat dose, between two and 10 microgram per kilogram intravenously. Mm. And then I would do infusion, um, one to 10 microgram per kilogram per minute, depending on child's symptoms. Mm. If child is not improving in the next five, 10 minutes, then I would take this very seriously. I would intubate the child, mm. ventilate the child, and try metaraminol. Metaraminol is what is it again? Now you now this is I'm not going to be able to rescue this from the recesses of my memory, I'm afraid. No, metaraminol. Norepinephrine, metaraminol, so these are all Oh, alpha mimetic. Yes. Yeah. So you need to give these medications, um, or you may try ketamine. Mm -hmm. So child will be managed in intensive care unit. Yeah. Um, once you failed all these steps up to propranolol. And you may try phenylephrine. Time has come for this child to be managed by intensivist, mm. cardiologist, and also to require emergency transfer to a surgical center for emergency shunt operation. Mm. 
because there is a real danger of losing this child. Yeah. Ketamine is also helpful. Paralysis and ketamine can be used in dire situations, but the unresponsive patients must be urgently admitted to a surgical unit for an emergency shunt procedure to establish a autopulmonary connection and additional blood flow to the pulmonary artery. Although we used to do emergency shunt operation in the past, over the past five years, now technology allows us to handle these babies without surgery. Mm -hmm. What can we do? In a cardiac tertiary center, where you can do invasive procedures, you can either balloon stretch the right ventricular outflow tract, mm -hmm. but the stretching alone would not work unless it is predominant the valva stimulus. If there is also muscular obstruction, you must put a stent as well as doing balloon. Mm -hmm. So stent implantation and stretching the stent and leaving it in the pulmonary outflow tract relieves the obstruction and avoids this baby having further severe spells. Mm -hmm. This is an interim procedure prior to total correction of tetralogy of follow. Yeah. What is important in tetralogy patients to prevent these hypoxic spells by educating the mother mm -hmm. and giving mom a detailed information with regards to how to recognize it, how to avoid it, and how to handle it at home prior to coming to hospital. Yeah. And the other thing is, it is important to make sure these babies will not be allowed to have tetralogy spells more than two occasions. Mm. If there is tetralogy of fallow spell but did not lead to full-blown resuscitation, child just looked a little bit pale and unwell, recovered quickly, that is the time for us to consider medication. Mm -hmm. We can also prevent these by giving them preemptively beta blockers. Propranolol is most commonly used. Mm. It can be given 0.5 milligram per kilogram per dose, three times a day or four times a day. If the child continues to have desaturations, dropping below 70%, and tetralogy saturations should be maintained between 70 and 90%. Mm -hmm. 70 and 85 is ideal. Up to 90 is very good. Over 95, you would be worried mm. because this patient might be pink fellow, might go into heart failure. Right. If it frequently drops below 70%, then you can increase propranolol dose from 0.5 milligram per gram per dose to one milligram per kilogram per dose, four times a day. If the child is too small, say child is premature or or young, yeah. they can go into hypoglycemia. Oh, I beta see. Blo of beta course. blockers yes, yes. are notorious in causing mm. hypoglycemia. Yeah. Therefore, I would ask you to exercise caution if using propranolol in preterm babies mm -hmm. or young infants and start with gentle dose, mm -hmm. then gradually increase it, but make sure a child will not be hungry, mm -hmm. will be fed. That is very important. We have seen babies going into hypoxic spell, but also hypoglycemic. Oh gosh. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, treatment of tetralogy of fallow on permanent basis, surgery is the ultimate treatment. We used to leave these children until they are in teenage years, but with the progressing bypass techniques and surgical techniques, we operate on these patients at around six months of age when they reach six kilograms. Mm -hmm. Surgery is very successful. The mortality is very low in, the, in Britain. It's certainly less than 2%, 30 days mortality, and one year mortality is less than 5%. Mm -hmm. Surgery involves resection of right ventricular outflow tract obstructing muscles, mm -hmm. plus and minus enlarging pulmonary outflow tract with a patch, valvotomy, or valvuloplasty. It is best if the pulmonary valve ring is not disturbed. If a patch is needed, pulmonary valve ring is enlarged, then these babies 
end up with pulmonary regurgitation and in the long run they might run into trouble with large right side which may require surgery in childhood. Mm. The best method is to preserve the native pulmonary vein. Right. VSD is managed by patching it. Sometime if it is small, additional VSDs may be treated with stitch. But the perimembranous VSD is usually large and it is managed with a patch. Mm. You don't need to treat right ventricular hypertrophy, it would disappear once the RV outflow tract or pulmonary outflow tract narrowing is relieved. Mm -hmm. Aortic override will be realigned with the closure of VSD. Most patients would not have any problem, but a few small number of patients may have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction if there is posterior deviation of the septum. Right. If the overriding is too much to the right side, or if the patient has double outlet right ventricle morphology, those are the ones that might develop left ventricular outflow tract obstruction in the future. Post surgery, problems with tetralogy of follow may be heart block mm -hmm. or right heart failure due to severe pulmonary incompetence. That can be managed with pacemaker if it is heart block, if it is significantly dilated right ventricle due to pulmonary incompetence can be managed with either pulmonary valve replacement with surgery mm -hmm. or by going from the groin via transcatheter approach. Mm -hmm. In the long run, tetralogy patients would remain asymptomatic and 75% would not need any further operation mm -hmm. in the next 20 years or 30 years. About 25% would need further operation either in childhood or within the first 20, 30 years due to significant pulmonary incompetence and enlarged right ventricle or residual pulmonary stenosis. Right. Very rarely due to residual BSD. Mm. That's exceptional. They lead normal lifestyle if they had good hemodynamic result. In the past, these patients used to have sudden death due to ventricular tachycardia because we used to repair tetralogy by opening the ventricle, mm -hmm. transventricular approach, but modern techniques use transatrial approach. Sudden death risk in tetralogy of follow patients drastically reduced. Oh. The other uh, problem used to be in tetralogy patients post repair, QRS prolongation, it was used as criteria to predict sudden death risk. If the QRS duration is over 180 milliseconds, mm. the risk of sudden death would be very high. Wow. But because of transatrial repair, we do not see QRS prolongation of that degree in recent years. Okay. Hence, sudden death risk is less. Yeah in the new generation. Other than um, the complications we mentioned from hypocyanotic spells, are there any other com um, complications that need to be managed with tetralogy of fallow? Or is it just complications associated with un um, possible underlying chromosomal abnormalities? That's a very good question. We need to remember 25% mm. of patients with congenital heart disease will have additional non-cardiac pathologies. Mm. Tetralogy of fallow is one of them. Mm. It is also associated with syndromes. Those syndromes have multi-organ involvement. Mm. Criducha, Vactel, mm. and tetralogy of fallow may be associated with syndromes too, yeah. not just chromosome abnormalities. Mm. Those syndromes can show a variety of non-cardiac involvement, mm. which may include renal pathologies, cerebral pathologies, gastrointestinal pathologies. Mm. Tetralogy of fallow patients may have intestinal obstruction as a result. They may have kidney abnormalities. They may go into renal failure. Mm. They may have cerebral abnormalities. Therefore, these patients may be reviewed and examined from holistic perspective. Right. The other complication with tetralogy of fallow patients Rarely they may have isomerism or heterotaxy syndrome. Mm. If it is associated with left atrial isomerism, 
then tetralogy patients may present with heart block. Mm. And if there is a child with intestinal obstruction, I will pay attention to ECG and make sure that child does not have any heart block. Right. If a child is fainting, the tetralogy of follow may not be just tetralogy spell, but maybe due to heart block and arrhythmias. Right. So we need to pay attention to it. Thank you for that, Professor Uzun. That was excellent, a really good cap of everything we, well, at our, our level, we need to know about a uh, tetralogy of fallow. What would be your key take home messages from this? Thank you. I'd like to propose 10 main points, like 10 commandments. <laughs> the point one tetralogy of fallow consists of four pathologies. One, pulmonary stenosis. Second, perimenorrhous subaortic VST. Uh, third, right ventricular hypertrophy. And the fourth, overriding aorta. Second point, it presents with mainly cyanosis and hypoxic spells, but pink fallow presents with congestive heart failure. Point three, examination reveals low saturations increased RV impulse and ejection systolic murmur in the pulmonary area. Point four, ECG shows right ventricular hypertrophy. Point five, chest x-ray shows boot-shaped heart with up-tilted apex. Point six, echocardiogram confirms the point one of four features of tetralogy of fallow. And when we come to the main problem encountered in the tetralogy of fallow, point seven will be hypoxic spells. The, the hypoxic spells would occur after warm baths, after feeds, and first thing in the morning after waking up. Mm. Point eight, spells would occur due to high pulmonary vascular resistance or decreased systemic vascular resistance. And point eight... Point nine. Is it point nine? It's yes, point nine now. well done. <laughs> I think I'm getting tired. Point nine would be management of hypoxic spells at home by the parents, even by us, when we don't have any tools to apply knee chest position. When we're in hospital, then we need to use appropriate medications, which will include beta blocker, either propranolol intravenously or esmolol as continuous infusion, morphine, either intramuscular or intravenous, phenylephrine, intravenous infusion, ketamine, noradrenaline, intravenous infusion, and intubation surgery. Those are the 10 points to remember, and I would advise you to take at least three of them home and retain it forever. Okay. Thank you very much. That's my mission. Thank you very much, Professor. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>